In this video, we're going to be covering the first part of our four-part crash course on RF diffusion using Neurosnap. For those of you who don't know, RF diffusion is a very powerful protein design model developed by the Baker Lab, and it has a lot of really advanced capabilities for stuff like binder design, motif scaffolding, partial diffusion, and even being able to design proteins with specific properties from complete scratch. RF diffusion essentially works via diffusion process similar to diffusion models like DALI, but in the protein space. A typical RF diffusion run will start with noise either being applied or added to a structure so that the model can then optimize this noise and ideally make a useful structure for us to use. A few caveats of this process is that RF diffusion does not directly predict new protein structures. Instead, structures outputted by RF diffusion only consist of the backbone and will need to undergo inverse folding and structure prediction in order to obtain the final and more useful results. Inverse folding is a separate process that consists of using a model like protein MPNN or MIFST to predict alternative sequences that fit into the backbone of a protein. Typically, when we refer to the backbone of a protein, we refer to the two carbon atoms as well as this nitrogen uh, that essentially forms the peptide bonds between the residues as well as the overall backbone of the protein. To learn more about inverse folding, we have a really great video on the process as well as protein MPNN, and we're going to link this in the description of the video for your reference. Now for this video, we're going to be covering binder design using RF diffusion, with other functions of the model being covered in the following parts. Additionally, we're going to be using the Neurosnap version of RF diffusion as it has a few optimizations and improvements that can result in higher accuracy predictions, and it's generally much easier to use compared to the base RF diffusion model. Now to get started, simply head over to the RF diffusion service on Neurosnap. From here, we're going to select the structure we want to create a binder against. I highly recommend first running your target structure through Neurosnap's PDB fixer tool beforehand, as many PDB structures in general contain defects like gaps and missing atoms that ARP diffusion might not be a fan of. Additionally, PDB fixer can be used to remove heterogeneous such as ligands, buffers, water molecules, and other non-biopolymer atoms that are not needed by RF diffusion. For this demonstration, we're going to be using program cell death ligand 1, or more commonly known as PDL1. PDL1 is a protein that plays a significant role in the immune system's ability to fight cancer. As a result, many regard it as a high interest target for drug development. Naturally, if any of you manage to cure cancer using our platform, please be sure to buy me a lunch or something in the future. Moving on, the next input we need to consider is the number of time steps. Lower numbers generally produce lower quality results, but have the advantage of taking less time. Recent improvements also suggest that 20 time steps is typically equivalent to the former default of 200 time steps, though this may vary depending on your input structure. Just to be safe, we typically set this to about 50 time steps, as the prediction time between 20 and 50 isn't particularly significant. Ultimately, my suggestion, my suggestion is to play with this number. The most pragmatic thing is to typically start with a small uh, number, such as 20 or 30, and if the results are not satisfactory, increase it to 50 or higher. Now for the binder design specific settings. First up, we need to specify the chain we want RF diffusion to create a binder against. In this case, if we look at the clean structure, we can see that the chain of PDL1 is A, so we will enter A over here. Next up, we have to specify the binding pocket. RF diffusion essentially allows you to truncate a protein structure to only include residues between these ranges. This can be helpful if you want to increase the speed of RF diffusion predictions, but it isn't strictly necessary. In fact, I personally recommend not adjusting these values unless you are dealing with a very large structure or complex. In our case, PDL1 isn't particularly large, so we can safely disable binding pocket cropping by simply leaving both binding pocket residues start and end at 1. Now we need to specify the length of our binder. One cool thing about RF diffusion is that instead of specifying a fixed length for a designed binder, we can instead specify a range and have RF diffusion choose a binder of any length within that range that it believes is the most optimal. I personally want to design a binder between the lengths of 30 and 46 because I feel like it, so I'm going to be updating these values accordingly. Lastly, we have hotspots. This field essentially allows you to specify residues of interest within your target PDB that you want to bias RF diffusion into creating binders within proximity to those hotspots. So if you have a binding site that you want RF diffusion to focus on, then I highly suggest putting those residues within this field. Note that hotspots only bias the model into designing binders around hotspot residues, but don't actually guarantee it. To specify hotspots, all we need to do is put the chain ID next to the residue index or residue range separated by commas. For the sake of demonstration, I want to specify residues 28 to 34, 50 to 56, and 71 to 80. 
Finally, we can now scroll over to the potential settings. Potentials are completely optional, but in some cases can be used to enhance prediction quality by biasing the diffusion process into designing structures with ideal properties. For binder design, the only potentials we can select are binder radius of gyration, or ROG for short, and binder and interface contacts. Binder ROG encourages the model to generate compact structures for the binder region by minimizing the radius of gyration, whereas binder and interface contacts encourages the formation of contacts within the binder region and at the interface between the binder and the protein target. Generally speaking, more contacts can contribute to the stability and specificity of the binder target interaction. In our case, we're just going to keep it simple and skip the potentials. So now that we're finally done, we're just going to celebrate by hitting that run job button and letting Neurosnap do its job. In the meantime, feel free to grab some tea as Neurosnap will automatically notify us once the results are complete. We are now back with the results, and as we can see, this job took about three minutes to run. And we can actually see the structure over here. The binder seems to be this uh, yellow and orange little chain, and the rest of the structure is mostly blue. So this coloring, what it entails, is it's actually the PLDDT values that come from AlphaFold 2. So um, as I mentioned earlier, this pipeline essentially is broken down into three different steps. You have the initial design stage with RF diffusion, followed by inverse folding with protein MPNN. And then after that, since protein MPNN is going to output a lot of sequences, we don't want to fold all of them. So we're just going to fold the, the, the top five best sequences according to protein MPNN. Next up, what we want to do is we actually want to take a look at the different metrics as well as the different structures that came out of this pipeline. So if we take a, if we scroll down, we'll notice that right away we have five different structures plus the RF diffusion backbone. So if we go over to the RF diffusion backbone, this is the original structure that was diffused by RF diffusion. And in this particular case, it's not looking great because the chain already had a split. RF diffusion can do this sometimes where it'll diffuse a part of the structure um, and after it might diffuse another part of the structure elsewhere. So in this particular case, that's already a pretty bad sign. Um, additionally, you'll notice that the entire structure is orange. This is just because right now we have the coloring set to PLDDT and RF diffusion doesn't actually produce PLDDT values. So if we were to change this to like chain, for example, then we'll get a better look at the actual chains. Anyways, I'm going to switch this over back to PLDDT view. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at rank one, rank two, rank three, rank four, and rank five. So essentially what this means is if we go take a look at um, the different ranks, we'll notice that this is the sequence for rank five. But if I switch over to rank one, it's a different binder sequence. Um, and this is because protein MPNN, as I, as I mentioned previously, it will output a bunch of different sequences and the current Neurosnap pipeline will essentially take the top five best sequences to then predict the structure of. So that's what these five little ranks mean. Now, in terms of like the structural metrics, they're right over here, right next to the protein MPNN score. For protein MPNN score, um, if you've seen our protein MPNN tutorial, you'll automatically know that lower scores are automatically better uh, or scores closer to zero is another fun way of remembering it. For RMSD, lower is also better. This is the RMSD between the predicted um, RF diffusion backbone as well as the predicted AlphaFold2 structure. So lower is better for this one. Now for PLDDT, if you've seen our AlphaFold2 tutorials, then these will be familiar um, metrics. PLDDT generally it's a per re, it's a per residue metrics, uh, sorry it's a per residue metric, and generally speaking, the higher the, the mean PLDDT is, the better quality your structure is going to be. Uh, max PAE is not particularly important. We'll talk a little bit more about PAE later. And PTM is also another metric where higher scores uh, are ten, tend to correlate with better results. Now we have a couple other plots for viewing results. Over here we have a chart of all the different PLDDTs um, at every single residue and we can actually see them broken down by rank. As we can see overall it's quite consistent between the different structures. This over here is a plot of the protein MPNN scores for all the different sequences that were predicted and we'll take a look at those different sequences later on. Now over here is actually a 2D animation of the diffusion process. So we can kind of see what ARF diffusion was doing. It put half of the binder over here and it put another half of the binder over there. I believe that this is due to the way that we specified the hotspot residues. So if we actually alter the hotspot residues to say maybe uh, this segment over here, then we'll probably get a much better result. So the PAE matrices are essentially the predicted alignment error in angstroms for any two residues if they were aligned on each other. 
generally speaking, this isn't going to be uh, enormously useful for this application, but it can be useful in determining uh, different domains as well as uh, where AlphaFold2 thinks the binder might be interacting with another segment of the protein. Lastly, we have the protein MPNN sequences. So the first chain is over here, and after the second chain is going to be uh, constant as we're not really designing the, the original um, PDCD1 chain. Now, um, what do you call it? The, the actual binder sequence, we can view it over here and it's delimited by a slash, and we can actually view the rank and score of all these different sequences. So right now you can see that one had the best score at 1.455, and the worst sequence was at 1.684. Now, I hope you like this tutorial, and if you have any questions or uh, would like to see another tutorial or have suggestions for a future video, please let me know and we'll try our best to accommodate. In the meantime, feel free to leave a like or subscribe if you want to see more stuff like this, and we really hope to see you in the next video.